Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Please stand with me. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And, and can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So we are uh, in a little uh, four-week series entitled all creation sings. We have looked at uh, water and land the last couple of weeks, and uh, for those of you who like pandas and elephants, we're going to do animals next week. Today our focus is on God's creation as seen through plants, and this is what we read in today's first lesson. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind, bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. God always emphasizes that creation is good. Everything about it is good. God, God loves what he made. God loves his creation. Now, the, the medieval church said that there are actually two great books of God. There is the, the book of Scripture, which we all know, and also there is the book of creation. So that, so that taking a walk in the woods is kind of like reading the Bible. And, and even sitting here in church, we, we sometimes feel closer to God when we look that way than when we look this way. And that's okay, because creation is good. Now, today our creation topic is plants, and, and I want to focus on, on one type of vegetation, my, my favorite one, trees, trees. Now, many years ago at our uh, previous church site, was, uh, which was two miles uh, east of here on Bass Lake Road and West Fish Lake um, Road, we, we bought a, a piece of land that was adjacent to the church. The property had a, a number of trees on it and was, in fact, designated as part of a, a tree preservation area by the city. Now, this is a, a great program designated to, to protect these large stand of trees from, from being clear-cut for development. But on this site, the city rerouted West Fish Lake Road right through the middle of that stand of trees, cutting down about a third of the protected trees, and and dividing the rest of the stand of trees in half. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to get our land, the church's land, rezoned in case we would ever need to cut down some trees in order to put in more parking spaces. I was not proposing that we would cut down any trees, just reserving the right to do so in the future. So I, I made my case before the planning commission. I was thoughtful, reasoned, witty, and succinct, as I always am. <laughs> the commissioners nodded in agreement as I spoke. Then one woman stood to oppose me, an elderly member of the Arbor Committee. I don't remember exactly what she said, but I, I do know that the beauty of trees was extolled 
And by the end of her presentation, many of the members of the commission were beginning to cry. The vote was nine to zero against me. And three of the members of the commission were members of our church. <laughs> I, I probably should have remembered Joyce Kilmer's poem, Trees, and the emotion that it elicits. I, I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. So what was I thinking? Why, why would I ever want to cut down a tree? I have since repented, and when Lord of Life relocated to this site, I made sure that no trees were harmed in the construction of this building. Why do you think we love trees so much? Well, well clearly, clearly trees are, are, are beautiful. They are beautiful. And, and, and they, they, they provide us shade from the heat on a, on a hot day. They, they absorb CO2 in a way that may save our planet. But there's something else. And, and I have a, a, a theory here. I, I think we love trees so much because a tree is exactly the thing that God created it to be. An oak tree doesn't try to become a maple. An apple tree doesn't try to grow grapefruit. And when their leaves start to fall, a tree doesn't get implants or attempt a comb over. A tree is most fulfilled when it's just being a tree. And that's a really attractive thing when something is exactly the thing that God created it to be. Which brings us to human beings. Now, on the sixth day when God created us, he described what he has, had made as not just good, but very good. But, but unlike a tree, we are not always content being, being the very good person that God created us to be. Even though God has made us very good, we are worried that we are not good enough. And that results in what Richard Rohr describes us as, as having a, a true self and a false self. The, the true self is described by the 14th century German mystic Meister Eckhart as a, as a place inside of you that neither time nor space nor created thing can touch. That, that place is what Christians call the soul. And we all have that soul. The, the soul holds a, a unique divine DNA that, that contains the essence of who you are. And, and, and that true self, the soul, is it's creative, free, selfless, loving, generous. It's authentic. More, more importantly, the soul is the place where, where you know that you are loved and accepted by God. That's your true self. But we also have a false self. We, 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 we call it, psychological terms, the ego, and, and, and everybody has one of those too. It's a persona that we create for ourselves, but we, because we are convinced that very good is not good enough. And, and the, the false self tries to calm its insecurity by saying, oh, look at the car I drive. Look, look at the house I live in. Look at the clothes I wear. Look at the, the six-year-old grandchild that I have that reads at a college level. Did I get that right? Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> the false self says, look at me. I'm great, not really believing it to be true. Comparison is the great energy giver of the false self. 
The false self needs to be smarter than her, thinner than him, richer than both of them. It always has to be better than. But if you always have to be better than, you'll never be good enough. The the true self, wrapped up in God, has a deep sense of radical okayness. It it doesn't have to prove anything. The the false self is is anxious and, 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 and fragile, which makes it easily offended. The the false self reacts to criticism with a a vengeance. And and, and you all have this experience. A comment is made about you. Your ego is bruised. You get get defensive. And in your defensiveness, you you either say something mean right back or or you stuff it. And and, and you just seethe about the person and what they said about you for for hours or, or even days. I have to say, it it happens to pastors, too. I'll tell you a secret. Pastors are really sensitive about our sermons. Because you're kind of vulnerable when you're up here preaching preaching a sermon. So, So shaking hands at the door, someone says, Pastor, you must have been really busy this week. Oh, why is that? because you clearly didn't have much time to prepare a sermon. (laughs) Oh, thanks. You know, I'm really envious of people who've never met you. (laughs) Now, when I was a young pastor, I would would see people yawning or, or looking at their watches during my sermons. It still happens, but but now you're peeking at your phones. We see you. (laughs) Or or, or I'd hear a negative comment. I'd hear a negative comment made made about my preaching. And I have to tell you, I'd lie awake at night thinking I was a failure. Now that's the false self talking. And, And I'll just tell you, Your false self moves very quickly from bad sermon to bad person. And and if I had stayed there, I wouldn't be standing here. But there's a true self in me too. And and when I would listen to that true self, listen to that, 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 that place inside of me that neither time nor space nor created thing can touch, listen to my soul, I'd hear a very different message. Don't worry, Peter. There's a Sunday every week, so you're gonna get a lot of practice over the next 36 years. You'll get better. And you're already pretty good. Trust me, you're okay. So how do we how do we come to have less false self and more and more true self? Well, Jesus talks about it. He talks about about dying to the self or or or, or losing yourself in order to find yourself. And 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 what he's talking about here is our our need to die to that false self and 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 live to our, our true self. But it's not always easy because because our false self is actually always lying to us, telling us all the ways that we're not good enough. Even Nelson Mandela understood this. Nelson Mandela, who, who said, my greatest enemy was not those who put me in prison. My greatest enemy was myself. I was afraid to be who I am. So we need constant reminders of of this truth that dwells in the soul because the false self is so strong. And, and, And that's why every week here in worship at Lord of Life, we repeat the same words. We say, we are children of God, loved beyond measure. 
Now, in your, in your true self, you don't, you don't have anything to prove. You're, you're, you're already very good. God made you that way. And, and God's goal, actually, is not that you perfect yourself. God's goal is that you be yourself. Be the you that God created. Christians often get this all wrong. We think, we think God loves us when we're, when we're able to complete a laundry list of, of do's and don'ts and, and shoulds. But, but what God really wants is for you to be the you that he created. Because there's only one of you. There's no one like you. We're lucky to have you. And, and, and perhaps if you feel your, your false self creeping in, you might, you might try doing what I do. You might want to consider going for a walk in the woods. Feel, feel the creator around you in the other book of God. Experience the, the trees that are so beautiful that we've been looking at this morning. So beautiful, just being the trees that God made them to be. A tree that's comfortable in its treeness. And then you, knowing that God loves you and accepts you no matter what, you can be comfortable in your Eunice. And, and, and walking through the woods, walking through the woods, you might even decide to recite a poem. I wish that I could always be as pure and faithful as a tree. My ego strives to, to take control, but my true self is in my soul, a soul devoid of ought and should, that trust that God has made me good. So at the trees, I smile, I nod, and know I am a child of God. Amen.